Hello and welcome back to the Blockchain.com podcast. My name is Garrick Heilman. I'm the head of research at Blockchain.com and a visiting fellow at the London School of Economics. The regulation of cryptocurrencies varies significantly across different countries and jurisdictions. And while negative headlines like so-and-so country has once again tried to ban Bitcoin tend to get the most media attention, less well covered are the countries and jurisdictions that are actively welcoming and competing to attract crypto entrepreneurs and investment. Now for years, Gibraltar has been praised by technologists and investors as one of the more savvy and balanced jurisdictions for crypto regulation. I recently spoke with Gibraltar's Minister for Digital and Financial Services, Albert Isola. Albert and I discussed a range of topics, including the secret to Gibraltar's early and ongoing success in attracting not just crypto startups, but digital entrepreneurs from other economic sectors like gaming, and the current state of crypto regulation, including Albert's thoughts on still emerging areas like DeFi, DAOs, and stablecoins. Well, Albert, welcome to the Blockchain.com podcast. We have a tradition here where we always ask all our guests how they earned their first ever money in life, if you can recall that. (laughs) Well, that's quite easy for me because um, I became a lawyer um, immediately after going to university in the United Kingdom and doing my bar finals and then coming home to work in in a family law firm. So uh, I've been a lawyer um, all of my life until eight years ago when I came into this job. So that's quite an easy question for me to answer. Excellent. And and tell us about your job and, and who you are and, and what it is you do. Um, I was elected in 2013 in a by-election in the Gibraltar Parliament. Um, I joined the government immediately and I was uh, given the responsibility of looking after financial services and online gaming. Um, we have a very active financial services community and indeed an online gaming community. And so... It was a heck of a challenge, Um, and I've been doing this job with some other additions uh, since that since that time in uh, uh, the fourth of July, an important date for for the US in 2013. Um, I think the 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 main responsibilities I've had are to one preserve um, the business that we had, and two look at new opportunities. We we are we are an agile community of people. Um, We always have been. Uh, and so we are very good at working within the niche areas. So how can you take advantage of our agility uh, in in making sure that the products that we have in both of those areas are fit for purpose, are uh, current to the, to, and relevant to today's community? Because obviously in that period of time, both financial services and gaming have moved on significantly. I mean, online gaming was telephone betting 25 years ago. They moved on to the internet. It then moved on to tablets and telephones and iPads. And so there's always these industries evolving. And so when you have that responsibility, um, looking at things like blockchain um, were were very exciting. Um, Very exciting because they were very innovative, which we like. Um, And for us, the challenge was, can we get involved in this space safely in a way that we can give the consumer um, some, some form of protection? And we felt the best way of doing that was by regulation. Uh, I've always felt that um, it's not uh, institutional investors' uh, appetite, within their appetite, to invest in firms that are unregulated. Uh, they have to be regulated to give the consumers that level of that safety net, that level of comfort. And so my job has, has entailed bringing us to where we are today, working hand-in-hand hand with the private sector. Uh, government doesn't pretend to know Uh, everything about everything or anything about everything. Um, So it's only by working very closely with the private sector that we can put ourselves in the position where we have sufficient comfort that the direction of travel is safe, um, it preserves the reputation of the jurisdiction, uh, and it does so in a way that protects the consumers, which are at the forefront of everything that we do. Uh, And so my job has been uh, fascinating, and, and particularly in the area of blockchain. We've done some other interesting things too in the online gaming and other areas. But in the area of blockchain, I think that's probably the one that's had most international recognition. Um, and, and it's great It's great to see it where we've got to since we started in 2018 and where we hope to get to in the years to come. 
absolutely. I just want to touch on the the gaming uh, background uh, and and Gibraltar's kind of edge there. Uh, and and how would you characterize um, why Gibraltar has been so successful in in um, attracting uh, you know gaming platforms and and uh, that whole segment of the economy? And and um, you know, I think there there might be some interesting kind of I guess parallels with your success there and 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 your success in, in blockchain, correct? Absolutely, um, absolutely. And the the ethos and the philosophy behind the, the the online gaming business that we started 25 years ago has been repl- replicated fully in terms of how we look at the blockchain work in in financial services. And that is that when we did this 25 years ago, there were three key component parts of what we were doing. And that was, we only wanted to have quality firms operating from Gibraltar. There was a requirement that they had to be regulated. And the third point is that they had to have their mind of management in Gibraltar. Uh, We took the view then, and we take the same view today, that we cannot uh, uh, regulate businesses unless their mind of management is in Gibraltar. Um, And so... When we when we when we um, had the online gaming business starting in Gibraltar, it was almost, I would say, by accident, uh, more than design, um, and we didn't have a regulatory framework in place when we started that process. So we actually regulated them by contract. So we issued them with a license, and then a schedule to that very lengthy license document were the regulatory aspects of the standards that we expected the firms to meet. Uh, and, and as we touched on in the opening, that has evolved over time to a fully-fledged gambling legislation, fully-fledged regulator with fully-fledged regulatory processes and systems. Um, in the blockchain space, those same three points of quality firms only operating from here, fully regulated, and minor management in Gibraltar have been copied. Um, and Because we believe that if you achieve those three points, you're going to be able to do that business safely because the regulation of our gaming and the regulation of our blockchain firms depends on the on the quality of the people. Um, we can't uh, regulate cryptos or we can't regulate blockchains, but we can certainly regulate the people um, that are engaged in that business of holding or storing uh, something of value for others by way of business. And so the philosophy 25 years ago and the philosophy today are very closely aligned to each other. Um, And it's worked for us extremely well uh, in the online gaming space. We have today some 13 B2Cs um, and about another 14 or 15 B2Bs. We uh, account for around 75% of the UK online gaming business is being booked through Gibraltar. If you look at the US, um, the first partners of the major US uh, bricks and and mortar gambling houses are Gibraltar businesses because they have the technology that they need in order to be able to attract the businesses that they're looking for in the United States as more and more of the states uh, legalize and allow this activity to take place there in a regulated manner. So there are many uh, parallels to to what we're doing on both sides um, and the online gaming space has has been uh, a good one. We, we, We have mostly household names i mean there's no if you look down the list of 30 names you will recognize probably 95 percent of them yeah absolutely and and uh a very envious position that gibraltar's in obviously by by having achieved such success there and uh um but let's let's turn to blockchain now and um Albert, when do you recall first becoming aware of of you know Bitcoin and 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 what was your first kind of interaction with with it and in the industry? Um, I I heard about it for the first time shortly after being elected in uh, in 2013, um, and I had a visit from a lawyer uh, in a, from a local firm in Jib who came to see me with uh, an individual that wanted to set up a business. Um, Dealing with Bitcoin uh, and and a number of other cryptos at the time, which were which were at the time was was very very early days, um, and I I very politely threw them at my office um, and said, "Don't want to know. Too high risk. Um, this is not something we can do." Uh, and then, over a period of time, um, we began to see that there was more and more interest in the space 
there were more and more people inquiring and and, and uh, becoming interested in whether it's something that Gibraltar would ever consider doing. And so what we did was in 2014, we set up a working group um, with people from the private sector and people from the private sector outside Gibraltar, inside Gibraltar, an ex-deputy uh, head regulator and a member from my Gibraltar finance team. Um, and they then spent two years uh with two consultation documents that went out and we consulted widely on, one, whether we should be looking at the space, two, if we did, how should we do it, um, and three, who should regulate it if we were going to do it. And, and those two consultation papers, which led to a final third one, um, by the time those three consultation papers had been done, we finished that in 2017, we came to the conclusion that we could do it, that we could do it safely, that we could introduce a regulatory framework using core principles, which are a different um, system of regulation to the traditional one, where it's 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 very in your box for insurance, in your box for MIFID firms and, and investment firms and banking and all the others. It was those are very rigid systems. So we came up with the idea of a more policy-driven, principles-based, policy-driven uh, regulatory system. And so that led to October 2017, when we actually published the regulations that we announced we would be implementing on the 1st of January of 2018. And that's when our new legal framework um, was, was born and came into play. So we moved fairly quickly, but it still took us three years from the first time that we discussed it to the introduction uh, of the legislation. Um, and, and now I look forward almost four years ahead um, and I see that we've got 15 very good quality firms licensed and regulated in Gibraltar um, working in some incredibly clever areas uh, from all parts of the world and it's 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 deeply satisfying to see that we've been able to achieve that within that four-year period we've we've had many many applications um, many of which don't make it uh, because either they they fall short of the standards in terms of the quality of corporate governance that we want, or they fall short of of the levels that we want in terms of their knowledge of the business and the technology. Uh, so for a whole variety of reasons, uh, we've ended up with 15 firms. A couple, couple of them are what I would call genuine startups, and some of the others are pretty big, well-known, chunky blockchain businesses, employing a lot of people uh, around the world. So the, the, the where we are today from where we started in 2014 with that first consultation document, uh, it's 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 pretty good to see. Yeah, absolutely, and um, I mean there were things happening though, at least um, uh, tangentially, even prior to the the finish uh, the fin- you know finish consultation. And I I'll just mention a specific example that I I think I remember correctly uh, that that was at least connected in some way to Gibraltar, um, the company Zappo, uh, one of the early crypto storage uh wallets um was was i think one of the earliest to launch a a crypto debit card uh bitcoin debit card uh i don't remember what year this was maybe 2016 2017 and i remember i was you know i uh, you know I, part of my job has been to like test new things and i got one of these cards and i think i'm pretty sure when i looked at like where the financial institution that was connected to this was registered or based, it was it was in Gibraltar, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know if you remember that particular example or, or anything that was happening um, prior to kind of the conclusion of your consultation. But uh, seems like things were percolating already um, in the years leading up to kind of finishing off that that framework. Is that is that correct or? Yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, I I think uh, Wences Casares from Zappo um, was on that very first working group that we set up in 2014 to provide advice to us. On, on what we should be thinking and how we should be thinking of doing it. Um, we also worked with people like Diego Gutierrez um, from RSK, IOV Labs. Um, so we were engaging at an early time with pioneers in the space uh, and, and they were able to give us a lot of insight in, into the regulatory aspects. I mean, why, why was regulation important for the, for the gaming firms as it is today for the blockchain firms? Because... When you're in an innovative area of business, 
what you crave for most, I guess, is legal certainty. Being able to demonstrate to people that you're working with that you are licensed, that you are regulated, that you have been scrutinized. I mean, we don't, these licenses take a long time to get. Um, you know, it's a 12 month process. Uh, some of them have taken longer, some of them have taken slightly shorter if the application is of an extremely good uh, quality. So we, we do uh, really delve into these firms to understand uh, what makes them tick, uh, what their security arrangements are like, what their capital is like, what the business plan is like, what their corporate governance is like, importantly. Um, and a lot of the thinking as to what the principles could and should be came from people like Zappo at the time. Who were, who were welcoming the interest that we were showing in setting up a legal and regulatory framework into which they could, uh, into which they could uh, become licensed. Interestingly, Zappo today is a fully-fledged licensed banking uh, firm in Gibraltar. It has a, a banking license here in Gibraltar with its premises in the center of town. Excellent. And, and speaking of the center of town, like what are the things that I've heard from a number of entrepreneurs who uh, have spoken very highly at Gibraltar is just how physically convenient all the key players are in terms of where they're located next to each other. You can get, I think, I think the, the, the key regulatory bodies or institutions are kind of all actually right, right next to each other. Is that, is that correct? Well, we're three square miles. So even, even if we were far apart, we're still very close. (laughs) Um, And, and so for me, you know, it's, it's a, if I want to meet with all of our gaming firms this week, I can do it. One, because they are few in numbers, uh, which is what we like. Um, and two, because they're very close by and we can meet at a moment's notice. That has another benefit to it. And that is that the regulator is also close by. Um, and one of the things that we work on very, very hard with our firms is to make them understand that the regulator is there for the minute they have a problem. The sooner you engage with the regulator, the more likely it is they're going to be able to hold your hand and help you, hopefully through that process, to come out of it in the best way possible. Um, And so the relationship between government, the regulator, and the private sector firms, to be able to sit around a table and talk to each other, is really a key strength of small jurisdictions like ours. Uh, You know, when we're sitting and, and working with the Funds Association about updating some of our funds legislation to ensure that the products are fit for purpose today. We sit with the association, we sit with the regulator, and we sit with government to make the policy which the regulator then requires to implement. It's pretty powerful to have everybody sat around a table, especially when, because it's a small place, the private sector firms know that the reputation of the jurisdiction is critical to their success also. So we're all going in the same direction. It's not a question of somebody trying to say to government, why don't we do this so that they can make a lot of money out of it and it's going to end up being a bomb for Gibraltar. We don't, we, we're all on the same page in having that same concern to ensure that we all preserve and protect the reputation and enhance the, the ability of the jurisdiction to do serious and professional business because then everyone wins. Uh, and, and blockchain, online gaming, that those two are examples of that in progress. It really is a, a very much a joint effort. Absolutely. I, I'm glad you brought up kind of the the uh, the kind of ability of, of of small jurisdictions like Gibraltar to kind of approach new technologies, new innovative corners of the economy in a in a different way, oftentimes than larger regulatory regulatory jurisdictions like the United States, like the EU. And I just wondered if you could kind of reflect a little bit on on why it is that it seems big jurisdictions seem to kind of oftentimes see something new happening, innovative, and, and kind of approach it from the perspective of fear or kind of like what could go wrong um, versus, you know, what could go right and, and what, what, you know, good things could come out of this. There does just seem to be kind of a difference in psychology almost, uh, it seems, you know, through the years going back to the internet and, and onwards around when something new pops up. Uh, a lot of big players seem to kind of like, you know, in a knee jerk kind of way, want to, you know, crack down or drop the hammer because they don't understand it. All they see are problems and risks. Well, I, I, there's no question that, that smaller jurisdictions are more agile. Um, smaller jurisdictions also have different risk appetites from small jurisdiction to other small jurisdiction. Um, and, and we're all different. 
but what we do have in common is our ability to move quickly. Um, our own priorities have always been, we're a small jurisdiction, we need very few businesses here to enable us to succeed in that particular niche area. And so we are not working for the masses. And, and so to put the, the, the bar of quality high, which is where we set it, um, meets, that, meets that need perfectly. So to, to think of having 15 blockchain firms from all around the world or 13 online gaming firms from all around the world is a very comfortable place for us to be because it enables us to do the business that we want to do safely and within a regulated environment and a regulated framework. Obviously, the European Union is a huge beast, uh, as an example, as is the United States, of, of a community of countries. Uh, and it's far harder to get consensus on risk appetite, on approach, on style, on all of these things. It's much, much more difficult um, to get to a place where you're going to have some form of consensus as to how you move forward. So I think the European Union, actually, in respect of crypto assets with, with MICA, with the markets in crypto assets documents that they've published for 2024 implementation, is actually quite quick. I was quite impressed. I didn't think it would happen within that time period. Um, so that tells you that there's a recognition that there is something there that needs to be looked at, that needs to be regulated, and if it's regulated properly, could actually continue to grow. Um, the US, I have no doubt, uh, will, will take steps forward from where it currently stands, once it agrees who should be regulating this space, if it's one of the current or whether it should be a new regulator all by itself. But to rely on, on the Supreme Court case of the 90, I think it was 1954, um, that has to change. And I've got no doubt that the approach is already ch changing. You've, the SEC has now authorized uh, you know, uh, crypto ETFs. And I think that's all going in the, in, the, in the right direction. But there's no question that we can move quicker than the US or, or, or the EU or indeed the United Kingdom, who have recently set up a, a think tank between the Bank of England and HM Treasury on CBDCs. I mean, there are many different segments to this technology and what it can do. And there are many, many different countries looking at different parts of it. What we did was take a slightly different approach in terms of focusing on the technology. Um, and, and, and regulating people that are, are using the technology for commercial purposes. And, and I think the approach that we uh, have implemented has been logical, sensible, and, and in the circumstances enables us to move with the technology by having the principle-based approach. Um, and that, that's, that, I think, was quite smart, and, and, uh, and I think it's, it, it's, worked, it's worked very well for us. We'll see how other different uh, groups and countries uh, move forward. But, you know, as, as I mentioned before we started this this uh, interview, we are keeping an eye on what everybody else does. You know, if people do things better than us, we will review what we do to ensure that we stay fit for purpose. Um, and, and we are very much in tune with the private sector, the regulator, um, to, to ensure that, that we are alive to the speed of the change and what we may need to be thinking about or need to be doing. Yep. And, and speaking of other small, smaller jurisdictions that have also been active around blockchain and crypto asset uh, frameworks, um, I recall, uh, and I, I, Albert, was, was it you? This is a few years back now. Um, in Singapore, there was an event um, where, uh, was that you who was at the Gibraltar kind of, um, you know, um, so there was a there was a Gibraltar kind of uh, kind of you know kind of event basically kind of promoting Gibraltar in Singapore. I think trying to trying to steal away some of the companies uh, that were were thinking about Singapore as a jurisdiction. Uh, do, do you recall that or? Um, I, I do. Funnily enough, um, <laughs> it was my team that did that. I was actually um, I had a, 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 a horrible stomach pain. Which prevented me from traveling there, and I was actually in Beijing. Okay, okay, so yeah. Instead of going from Beijing to Singapore, I came home. Um, so, but it was my team uh, from Gibraltar Finance that organized that, uh, and they were all there and hosted the Gibraltar event. Um, so, yeah, I, I remember it well, but for the wrong yes. reason. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I was like, I, you know, there's been so much uh, that's happened. And, and, you know, I tell people that, you know, crypto years are kind of like dog years. You like cram like seven years worth of activity oftentimes into a single year that things that happened a few years back start to get a bit blurry. But uh, but uh, it, it, it just it reminded me about how 
you know, active, um, smart jurisdictions often are in outreach and, and going to places like Singapore. I mean, another example, a funny story that Dan Moorhead at Pantera uh, Capital here in, in California tells is how early on the, the president of Luxembourg um, was, was out in Silicon Valley, literally knocking on doors uh, saying, Hey, come to, come to Luxembourg. And, and that really made an impression on Dan. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, and, and that the, the president would actually make that kind of effort and really, you know, rather than say, Oh, stay away, you know, you're bad. And, you know, really, really putting an effort into opening the doors and inviting companies, innovators, entrepreneurs to come set up. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the competition, uh, amongst smaller jurisdictions, who are your key competitors and, and, and how Gibraltar differentiates itself? I, I, I think the, the premise to your question is absolutely right. Um, I mean, I can tell you that in 2018, uh, as soon as we'd uh, implemented the legislation, we spent the whole year traveling around the world. I mean, we did uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, Beijing. Uh, we went to Latin America. We obviously went to the UK. Um, we've been to Brussels. I mean, we've spoken and explained what we're doing and why we're doing it all over the world. And I don't think it's a I don't think it's a coincidence that we've got firms in Gibraltar from every one of those areas that we went to in 2018, explaining and evangelizing what it is that our framework was going to be doing. Um, I think as a result of that, um, many people have taken uh, a slightly different, many jurisdictions have taken a slightly different approach. You'll recall in 2017, 2018, just as we were gearing up towards this framework, there was a lot of activity in ICOs and token sales. Um, and we were very concerned about token sales because Although we believe that a token sale is a very uh, cheap and efficient way of raising money for startups, particularly in this space, we were concerned about the possibilities of people getting involved in that who shouldn't be involved because there was no oversight, there was no regulation. You set up a company, you issue tokens, and, 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 and you're away. Um, and that worried us an awful lot. Some jurisdictions went for that market. We specifically took the opposite route um, and extended immediately the proceeds of Crime Act to any firm issuing a token. And what that means is that any firm issuing a token had to immediately appoint uh, a money laundering reporting officer and comply with our Proceeds of Crimes Act, particularly in the area of money laundering. So anybody subscribing for a token, they had to go through due diligence, source of funds, know your customer, all the traditional financial services uh, steps you require to take before you onboard a client. We applied all of those onto the token sales, and we carried on working on the legal and regulatory framework for the blockchain, which is what we did. So, if I look today at um, which other jurisdictions are most closely aligned to what we're doing, I think they're very, very different. And each of these jurisdictions has taken a different approach. I don't. I think different for different countries have different forms of licensing. But we're all very, very different to each other. And that's nothing new. If, if you go back 20 years to how different jurisdictions regulated trust and company managers um, or regulated how e-money institutions were operating, even then, they were all very different. Um, and I've always said it's horses for courses. You know, the different people want different things from different types of regulation. Uh, and we've gone for the fully-fledged, Belt and Braces approach to, to regulation in this space. Uh, we don't believe in light touch regulation. We believe on fully fledged, full on regulation, which is why you've got a complete process. There's no shortcut. You've got to go through the whole thing. Um, it's not cheap. It's quite expensive and it takes quite a long time. But that's the only uh, approach that we believe is going to give the firm the confidence uh, that the, the regulatory approach is the right one. And if I look at what's happened in gaming, the gaming firms themselves use the fact that they're based in Gibraltar as a badge of respectability because of the reputation that we enjoy as an online gaming jurisdiction. This is exactly the same where we're going to be going with the blockchain. The firms that come to Jib know that they are joining a club of well-known, good repute, high-quality, well-regulated firms. And that's good for us. Um, so I don't see any other jurisdiction competing with us. I see all the other jurisdictions getting to the same place in slightly different ways. And if you look at it a slightly different way, um, my ambition and, and our ambition here 
has always been for to, to get to the stage where there are an international set of standards for firms operating in this business. Um, and the sooner we get to that point, the better. So the more jurisdictions can regulate, the better, because they are each going to have a minimum set of criteria where we will all be on the same level playing field and we will all be able to give to the, to the blockchain industry a degree of certainty. Um, and the sooner we get there, the better. So, you know, our position is we welcome the, the the EU's approach. We welcome the US moving forward, the UK moving forward, and other smaller and larger jurisdictions taking a pragmatic approach to how this sector can grow in the future. Because there's no doubt that the technology uh, is going to take a more and more important and more significant position within financial and other different types of businesses in the future. Uh, and so the quicker we have this international level of standards, uh, in my view, the better. I want to just touch on, I think, something really important you mentioned, which is, uh, you know, the, the the fact that you are attracting, you know, some of the most well-respected entrepreneurs and innovators in the space like Winces and Zappo. And, um, you know, you're having kind of taken a more skeptical view of the ICO boom in 2017 when other jurisdictions were racing to try to open the doors and, and capitalize on that, you know, that, that wave of investment and, and innovation. And, and, you know, it, it almost sounds to me kind of like, uh, you know, you're, you're in some ways, um, you know, there's, there's some similarity almost with what a venture capitalist kind of does in terms of screening and, and doing diligence and, and, um, you know, thinking about, you know, the right horses to back, so to speak. And I just wondered, is that, is that, is that off the mark? Is that, or is that a, a reasonably fair comparison to, to how, how you're approaching um, some of these hot new trends? I, I think there's no question that um, our desire is to attract good quality firms. Um, and by seeking to attract good quality firms, by forcing them to go through a regulatory licensing system where they've got to be scrutinized to a, a, a quite a severe degree, you're not going to get somebody submitting to that procedure and process unless they are confident that they're going to come out at the other end. So that in itself, just by having regulation and a licensing system, is going to, is going to cut out a lot of people who will not hit the mark that we require. So the consequence of licensing is that you do only get firms that are serious about what they're doing coming through your system. Uh, so, so the objective of quality firms is achieved in the main by having a regulation, a regulatory system in place. Um, so, so yes, it, it, it is our publicly stated mission to attract quality business to Gibraltar, which is, which is part of the team of people that want to be regulated and want to be scrutinized and want to work in accordance with minimum standards and minimum rules. Um, you know, we comply with every single EU directive, even though we've left the EU um, as of 31st of December last year, we still have those on our domestic statutory uh, uh, books. So every firm in respect of AML, exchange of information, all of those laws are, are on our books and we exchange information and we require every single firm to adhere to the highest standards of, of AML, due diligence and know your customer, source of funds. All of these things are, are inbred into everything that we do, not just blockchain, of course, but in everything else. Blockchain, I think, is the, well, probably the first jurisdiction that forces exchanges to go through this process when they onboard a client. And it's difficult, but there's a price to doing business properly. Um, and we are quite uncompromising in how we do that. I wonder if we could briefly touch on some of the uh, kind of uh, hottest, for lack of a better term, <laughs> uh, kind of areas of crypto regulation and, and what Gibraltar is doing or is, is thinking about these particular categories. Um, and I'll just, I'll just list off a few and you feel free to add to the list and, and say as much or as little as you want to on any of these. Um, stable coins, which you mentioned briefly earlier in the, the related central bank digital currencies, uh, DeFi, decentralized finance, meaning everything from, uh, you know, decentralized exchanges to, um, you know, um, money market protocols, 
uh, DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. I'll leave it at those three. Th- those are three topics that are generating, you know, in, in jurisdictions like the U.S., quite a bit of regulatory interest. What can you say about Gibraltar's approach to those those categories or other areas that are also receiving outsized regulatory attention these days? Well, our, our position is that the net that we've thrown around um, the technology in our in our regulatory approach captures all of those. Um, all of those items, and if they're not captured, they are not legal. So we have a, I mentioned we work with the associations, we have an association called Gantt, which is the Gibraltar Association for New Technologies. Um, and they, that, that association comprises of primarily um, DLT firms, lawyers who advise DLT firms, accountants who advise DLT firms. So it's the professional body that we work with. And they are in the process of of doing a thinking paper on DeFi, uh, and it's going to touch on some of, on DAOs and some of the other bits and pieces that you've mentioned there, stable coins, and also includes to an extent how we should be looking at NFTs. Um, so, our, our relationship with the professional association uh, is one where they will float ideas and they will produce thinking papers, which will hopefully help government to formulate its own policy uh, hand in hand with the regulator. So. As soon as we get that thinking paper from uh, Gantt, we will then have a discussion with the regulators what we think before we go back to the association and and test and decide whether we want to pursue any of those avenues further by throwing the net out wider um, in in terms of wider consultation documents. I can tell you that that one of the things that we've done most recently and we're in the process of doing now um, is we are in consultation with the, the, the industry in Gibraltar on what we call the 10th principle. Our, our, our legal and regulatory framework is based on nine core principles, and we are just about to introduce a 10th. And the 10th is in relation to uh, market abuse and market manipulation. Um, it's the first uh, regulatory attempt at dealing with market manipulation in this area. And so it's taken us seven or eight months working again with a private uh, working group from the private sector, uh, my my uh, office downstairs and the regulator to come up with a what is in effect a, a, a short statement as a 10th principle and then some guidance notes to help uh, uh, firms understand what it is we're trying to do. Um, it's obvious why we think that is necessary uh, and why we're doing again our little bit in trying to see whether in a new area like this we can begin to shape thinking in terms of how we can best protect consumers from market abuse. So, again, the approach of a public-private sector partnership with the regulator sitting around the same table in all the areas you've mentioned, whether it's DAOs or whether it's DeFi um, or whether it's market manipulation, is what is going to lead us to be in what we all jointly consider to be the best possible place for the jurisdiction. That's that's fantastic. Uh, you know, I, I think people, the critics of of the the blockchain space, the crypto industry, uh, don't appreciate always how things do get better, and and if there are problems, you know, that emerge as there often are with anything new, you know, the internet's a famous example of this. How a lot of bad actors flocked to it early on, um, took advantage of people's you know naivete and a familiarity with with the with new technology. That's just you know often how things go. You're going to see problems emerge. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, it's not like that's the way it always has to be. And, and there can be improvements over time through a focus on better data transparency, you know, you know, professionalizing, you know, bringing proven practices from other sectors, of the economy to things like exchange markets, these things all make, make a difference. They're happening. And, uh, I, I think crypto markets continue to become, you know, uh, you know, better for, for lack of a better term. Um, Albert, Albert, uh, what, what else have we not covered? I, we're, we're just about running out of time and I, I want to, you know, give you a chance to bring up anything else, uh, that we haven't touched on that you think is important. Of course, we want to let people also know where they can go to learn more about you and Gibraltar, but, uh, yeah. W- what else would you, would you say here as we, we get close to the finish? I think Eric, to be honest, you've covered, um, all of the points, um, that I can think of in terms of our approach, our thinking, 
our philosophy and why some people are coming here. Um, I, I don't think there's anything. The latest uh, is uh, the only one thing that I would mention is we have um, teamed up with uh, IOV Labs. We are in the process of doing a transition uh, in government uh, through e-services to digitizing our government interaction with the, with, the, with the private sector. And we have agreed and announced last week with IOV Labs that they are designing a blockchain part of that. So we are not just going to be talking blockchain, but we hope at the end of this pilot project, uh, within 12 to 14 months, to be able to be using blockchain ourselves, um, which is which is quite a nice uh, uh, touch to everything else that we're doing in the space. Uh, thank you for mentioning that. I, I've long been very excited about um, yeah broadening the the range of things that blockchain can can do, and um, you know there's some early work being done on things like digital identity and exactly you know, there's various efforts around voting and. Uh, these things are not easy. I, I was involved in the UK with looking at um, you know using blockchains for food supply chain and and yeah. evaluate some some work there by the Food Standards Agency. And it's this is hard to do uh, to be totally totally frank uh, to make this stuff work. But there is certainly some really interesting possibilities around bringing some of the core principles of blockchain technology: the transparency, yeah. the auditability, the traceability, um, you know, the 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 tamper resistance. Et cetera, et cetera, to to sectors of society that would really benefit from having some some added security and, and enhanced transparency. So, uh, applaud your efforts there, Albert. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for making time. My pleasure. Very nice to meet you, Gary and Lorna. Thank you for your time, and uh, and I hope uh, to see you again in the in the near future. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you're enjoying our podcast, please rate us and leave a review as it really helps boost our visibility to more listeners.